say Donald Trump said on his first day he's going to be a dictator for a day. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I like that. Would you rather have Donald Trump as a dictator for four years or re-elect Joe Biden for four years? I would rather have Donald Trump. I'd like to see the repeal of the Roosevelt law so that he can be a president for a lot more than four years. But we, this country, needs a dictator. I hate to say that, but it's the truth. My guest today is Dr. Stephen Hassan, a licensed mental health professional and recognized expert on cults. His book, The Cult of Trump, examines how Trump has built a base with fanatical devotion. Dr. Hassan correctly predicted that there would be violence after the 2020 election if Trump did not win. Stephen, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me on. You have said that the human brain is especially vulnerable to hacking. I want to start there because I think that idea is essential to the power of cults uh, and it's going to inform just about everything we are talking about today. What do you mean when you say the brain is vulnerable to hacking? We are uh, living organisms that are dependent on our our senses for taking in information and we have what's called system one and system two thinking. This is from the Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And what he was able to show scientifically is that we have a lot of unconscious scripts that we are using to make predictions. And most of the time we're working mindlessly moving through our day, going through routines, and we only occasionally stop and really analyze data and evidence and, and, and challenge our thoughts and how we came to adopt beliefs. And there is something in psychology that's critical uh, to explain this, it's the single most important principle of social psychology, in fact. It's called the fundamental attribution error. And it's a lot, of, a lot of technical words, but what it means is that when people are trying to understand other people and why they do what they do, we have an unconscious bias to over-attribute dispositional or personality variables and underestimate social influence variables. In other words, we like to walk around saying, I'm independent, I'm thinking for myself. It's the other person who's in the Moonies, which was the cult that got me recruited back in the 70s when I was 19, which caused me to get interested in this whole topic. Anyway, People will assume there was something wrong with Steve instead of going, what was going on in Steve's life? And what was going on in the recruitment and indoctrination thing? And what was going on was my girlfriend dumped me, three women were flirting with me, lying to me, claiming they were students, <laughs> saying they weren't part of a religious group. And it was a step-by-step -step incremental set of manipulations where I didn't understand there was a system being used to hack me. And I later became a leader and learned the system. I later wrote a book called Combating Cult Mind Control about the system of how cults, destructive authoritarian cults, I should add, operate. But I, I just want to state categorically that we we are dependent on each other for reality testing and 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 the notions that have been circ circulating about uh social darwinism and selfishness is good and altruism is bad is just not true historically anthropologically we have excelled as a species because we teach each other hey watch out for this over there that's you know there's a tiger over around that corner you know don't don't go out late at night by yourself without a spear or two we depend on each other and there's a book by two neuroscientists called the knowledge illusion in fact where they demonstrate 
that people walk around thinking they know how things operate, but when you ask them point blank, explain how a, a toilet flushes, they have no clue about what the mechanisms are that actually cause the stuff to go down. So it's this illusion. And now with Google and with internet, people are walking around thinking they have godlike powers to know anything. And that's where QAnon and all of these conspiracy cults online are hacking people left and right because they, they're, they're made artfully, they're made with certainty, they're using names of people with authority, you know, backgrounds. He was in the CIA. Well, there's a lot of cleaners who sweep the floors at the CIA too. You know what I'm saying? So that people can get hacked, but have the illusion that they're doing research and actually understanding stuff when they don't have a clue. I think the most important part of your story is not the fact that your brain was hacked, your words, but that it was debugged, that you found a way out. And I, I want to spend most of our time talking about that because I would imagine most of the people listening, this certainly applies to me, know people, care about people who have been drawn into the cult of Trump and there isn't an easy way out. As you've said, the deprogramming is slow and it's incremental. And that was your experience too, right? So I had a bizarre situation where I was recruited in February of 1974 at Queens College and the Moonies had, were, were, were operationalizing on campuses around the United States. And I was one of the first to, you know, get recruited at that point and was told to drop out of school, etc. And I went in so deep and hard, I literally dropped out of college, quit my job, donated my bank account, believed my family were satanic. And I come from a Jewish background. We don't believe in demons and Satan, like at all. But I got so deep and so programmed by the top leadership that I don't think I ever would have left. I would be there today, except that I fell asleep at the wheel of a van. I was, I should say I was sleeping three to four hours a night, normally seven days a week, but I was driving a fundraising van. I was up three days straight, woke up as I was driving into the back of a tractor trailer truck at 80 miles an hour, took emergency crew 30 minutes to pry me out of the wreckage while they thought it would blow up on the Baltimore Beltway. And then I was in a hospital. And this was 1976, way before cell phones were invented. I'm in a hospital away from the cult, sleeping and eating. <laughs> I was like really banged up. I needed two surgeries on my leg. But I was away. And um, that is a key to helping people get out of mind control is to stop the constant reinforcement of the indoctrination, which is now being currently done on cell phones and, and tablets and computers. That's, that's the enemy right now in terms of how our minds are being hacked remotely and at scale. But basically, I was at, in this hospital needing surgery. The one person in my family and my friends that didn't say I was brainwashed in an occult, which made me have to designate them as Satan, was my sister Thea, who always I was always close with, and she always said, I miss you. How are you? I, I, I want you in my life. You know? And I called her from the hospital, I told her I was, I was in the hospital. She's like, come home, I'll take care of you. And you have a nephew. I want him to know his Uncle Stevie, which is what she called me as a kid, right? So that was activating the real me that was below the cult programmed mind hack. And that's where, going back to your question about hacked, is the best way to understand mind control is it's a dissociative disorder where the cult identity is programmed to control and suppress your real self, 
You're, you're tricked into believing you're following God or you're following your higher self, you're, you know, et cetera. And it's, and it, there's an equivalency to how a computer can get hacked, right? To take over your operating system by clicking on the wrong links. It's, there's a parallel here where the real me got activated. I was a leader. I was able to get permission to visit my sister. I made her promise not to tell my parents or my oldest sister, Steph, because they were evil. She promised but she did tell them. So there was Steve with crutches and a cast from the toes to my groin in my sister's living room sofa. My father shows up unannounced, takes my crutches away and says, we're going to talk to you about your involvement with the Unification Church. And I was like, Satan. You know, but so I was not voluntarily wanting to leave. And it, very quickly, my story, um, I, I was told to call into the group so they knew I was okay because there was a concern about forcible deprogramming. Even though I was a model member and a leader, they were still worried about that I would be brainwashed by the deprogrammers. Long story short, I started asking to see my mom, who always would do whatever I wanted her to do growing up, being the only son youngest child i want to see mom you know so my dad was like let's go drive and see mom well he was they were moving me to another location for the deprogramming i get to another location i'm thinking i'm gonna snap my father's neck on the long island expressway because we weren't getting off at the right exit that's how, again how programmed i was and then we arrive at this other location and a football player type body person starts walking to the car. And I said to my father, if you think he's going to force me to go in, I will kill him and I will kill you because I am not going to betray God. I know the Messiah is on the earth, there's some young moon. And my father did the unexpected. He started to cry. <laughs> and I was like, and he said, what would you do if it was your son who met a group of controversial people, dropped out of college, left your life? How would you feel? And I'm, I'm watching my father who was very old school, macho man, never cried. And I could feel that he genuinely <laughs> was worried about me. I was like, probably what you're doing now, thinking he's brainwashed by the communist media. I said, what do you want me to do? Just talk to these ex-members for a few days. If you want to go back, I'll drive you there myself. But at least your mother and I will, will uh, know that we did the responsible thing. So at that point, it became voluntary which is what led to meeting with ex-members, hearing their stories, learning about Chinese communist brainwashing, and it was undis indisputable that all eight criteria of Robert Lifton's book, 1961 book, Thought Reform and the Psychology of Totalism, fit the Moonies. And I was still programmed, right? <laughs> And the thing that got me out of it was the last day, they handed me one of Moon's speeches. And this is a key to helping people get out, is not trying to persuade them, you're wrong, you've been brainwashed. It's asking questions in a respectful way and waiting. So they hand me the speech and they said, read this and tell us what you think. And I'm reading Moon's talk to congressmen and senators about how surprised he is that anyone could imagine that he, Reverend Moon, a Korean, could brainwash American youth because he respects Americans so much. And he's surprised at the accusation. And I was like, what a liar. It was the first negative thought in two and a half years that entered my consciousness. And as soon as it entered my consciousness, I'm like, if he's a liar, then he can't be the Messiah. He can't be doing God's will. 
what the hell have I been doing? And I cried for three hours. But I'm describing a snapping moment that was very unique to the circumstances that's different than what I teach family and friends how to help people in the cult of Trump. Yeah, I definitely want to get to how that maps onto the the cultish thinking in MAGA world that we're, we're facing today. Sure. But I... I, I want to better understand the feeling of, of being inside that cult and thinking that everyone else are, are the crazy ones. You, you describe being so deep into it that even the incredibly unethical things you were being asked to do, lying to raise money, killing your parents you I'm, I shouldn't be laughing, but you described no it's moment, it's crazy. It's crazy. None of it seemed wrong to you because the ends always justified the means, especially if you were answering to a divine power. Yeah, exactly. It, 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 my mind was taken over and I was no longer thinking as the extra honor student who skipped eighth grade. I was no longer thinking for myself, using my conscience and my values. Every My identity was no longer the son of Milton and Estelle Hassan of Flushing, Queens, New York. I was the son of Sun Myung Moon and Hak Jahan, the true parents of the universe, the true Adam and Eve who were sinless, who were going to do these mass weddings and help purify people to have sinless children. Very racist cult, by the way, that owns the Washington Times, the Washington Times Foundation, and is at the center of climate science denial for 50 years, I learned recently. But in any case, yeah, my, I, but think, I want you to understand, I was sure I wasn't brainwashed and I wasn't in a cult. I was doing God's will. This was Satan's world. And I, I'll add another piece that's very important, which is what I call phobia programming. And phobias are irrational fears and, um, it's a new concept for people to understand phobias can be intentionally programmed into another human being in order to control them. But that is, in fact, a major mind control technique. I have a, a model called the BITE model of authoritarian control that stands for behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. And phobia programming is the single universal um uh, emotional mind control technique. So in the Moonies, I was taken to see The Exorcist with a, a hundred other Moonies. We were bussed up. We were taken in vans actually to Tarrytown to hear Father Moon, who said God made this movie. And this movie is a prophecy of what happens to people when they lead the Unification Church. And at that moment, because I was so petrified from watching this movie, I was afraid of any negative thoughts or demons trying to invade my mind. And I was trained to do thought stopping, which is a behavior modification technique, where I was taught to say to myself, crush Satan, crush Satan, glory to heaven, peace on earth, glory to heaven, peace on earth. You know, true parents, true parents. So you suppress the doubts because they're not from you. They're from demons, except it was from me. <laughs> except it got hacked. Is there a trait that people who are susceptible to this kind of recruitment have in common? Because it's not low and Breathing, breathing. Okay. Well, please expound because we know it's not a lack of intelligence. It's not a lack of education. Right. There are smart, highly educated people. It's nothing demographic or uh, it's, it, it's not income-based. Is there something that can uh, can identify risk factors? Is it loneliness? I mean, you no. There's describe... there's risk risk factors for sure. Like folks on the spectrum, the autism spectrum, mm -hmm. um, are often like hard. It's hard for them to read social cues and feel comfortable with other humans. They're more comfortable with screens, 
And then they get recruited online through video gaming with strangers who then swarm them and love bomb them and make them part of their unique little club. And then it, it's one step after another. So that's a vulnerability. People um, who have been sexually traumatized as a child might be more susceptible if the recruiter knows that that's one of the the, the historical things. Um, what else? A high hypnotizable people are very creative. They have hypnosis is not sleep, by the way. It's a, a ability to focus your attention and be absorbed. So if you are the type of person who goes to the movies and you're in the movie, you're, you're, you have a high hypnotizable quotient or reading a book and you're in the book which is a superpower really for super successful people, successful athletes, musicians, artists, speakers. But when you're in that state, you're more susceptible to be hacked because your, your critical thinking, which is your frontal cortex is offline. You're in a flow state. You're in a zone, right? Um, I want to just say situational vulnerabilities is the most common thing that I have come across in my 47 years. So death of a loved one, divorce, uh, moving to a new city, state, or country. I mentioned sexual trauma or, or uh, physical assault or something like that. Situational things. Like my girlfriend dumped me and three women were like, oh, Steve, how are you? You're so smart, Steve. And I was like 19 years old and horny, guilty. You know, it's like college student. Yes, guilty. But I had no interest in joining a group or changing my life or throwing my own poems away. I was a creative writing major. But I want to say we're living in an age that humans have never lived in before. Computers and digital environments as new and and we our brains are getting rewired by being online so many hours and the and the pandemic has supercharged things so that people are getting addicted dopamine hits to likes and followers etc doom scrolling um and um What's also different, I'll, I'll finish in one second, is that when I was in the Moonies, we had to talk to people to find out their background, to size them up, to find out how to best approach them. Now there are 5,000 plus data points on every voting American that's in the dark web that AI can use to develop uh, nudges to program people. And people are oblivious to how sophisticated AI is now with, on scale through social media. Hi, everyone. I want to give a big shout out to all those who have signed up to support this show through my Patreon page. We are off to a fantastic start. Thank you for making it possible. And if you haven't subscribed, I hope you'll consider it. In the coming months, I'll be posting early and exclusive content, including a trailer for the Against All Enemies documentary film, which has been racking up awards at film festivals around the world and will soon be released here in the U.S. Stand by for more details on that. And if you're a subscriber to my Patreon page, be on the lookout for an early preview. Thanks again, everyone. Heart health and staying healthy, especially when you have family, friends, or loved ones that you want to be able to spend as much time as possible with, is so important. February is Heart Health Month in the U.S., and more than half the population would benefit from blood pressure support. Super Beats Heart Shoes are the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended way to support healthy blood pressure. And they even promote heart healthy energy without the stimulants. Paired with a healthy lifestyle, the antioxidants in Super Beats are clinically shown to be nearly two times more effective at promoting normal blood pressure than a healthy lifestyle alone. And with over 40,000 five-star reviews and counting, People are raving about Super Beats Heart Shoes. Super Beats Heart Shoes are absolutely delicious and are much better than any alternative supplement out there. 
Super Beats is also the number one doctor, pharmacist, and cardiologist recommended heart chew for cardiovascular health support. It's blood pressure support you can trust. Support your heart health with Super Beats heart chews. Get a free month supply of Super Beats heart chews on all bundles and a free full-size bag of turmeric chews valued at $25 with your order by going to BoatsBeats.com. Get this exclusive offer only at BoatsBeats.com. If someone would have told me that there are science-backed ingredients that could help me feel years younger in a matter of months, I wouldn't have believed it. Then I tried Qualia Senolytic. As we age, everyone accumulates senescent cells in their body. Senescent cells cause symptoms of aging such as aches and pains, slow workout recoveries, sluggish mental and physical energy associated with that middle age feeling. Also known as zombie cells, these are old and worn out cells and not serving a useful function for our health anymore, but they are taking up space and nutrients from our healthy cells. Qualia Senolytic removes those worn out senescent cells to allow the rest to thrive. Take it just two days a month. The formula is non-GMO, vegan, gluten-free, and the ingredients are meant to complement one another, factoring in the combined effect of all ingredients together. Qualius Analytics has a 100-day money-back guarantee. Since taking it, I have higher energy levels, feel years younger and more productive, not to mention fewer aches and pains. Resist aging at the cellular level. Try Qualia Senolytic. Go to neurohacker.com slash boats for up to $100 off and use code boats at checkout for an additional 15% off. That's neurohacker.com slash boats for an extra 15% off your purchase. Thanks to Neurohacker for sponsoring today's video. Let's talk about the cult of MAGA, because I, I see so many commonalities. I mean, the fact that it was the example of Chinese communism that helped deprogram you is just so richly ironic, given the opposition or the um, professed opposition within MAGA to, to communism, yet it uses many of the same tools and techniques to to recruit and in your words, brainwash its adherents. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I point out in the cult of Trump that a lot of the techniques are projecting what they're doing wrong onto the enemy or to the other to misdirect and to confuse and disorient. By the way, if you want to mind control someone, the first thing you want to go for is confusion. And the fastest way to confuse people is to overload them with information at a rate faster than they're able to digest it. And what's happening with algorithms in YouTube, and this is all scientifically valid now, is YouTube through their algorithms were radicalizing people on the left and the right to getting more and more extreme by the autoplay suggestions because they were wanting more attention so they can make more money, but it was actually creating more polarization, etc. I want to also say that, uh, so in, in working to help people in the cult of MAGA, working, talking about Chinese communist brainwashing is a very effective tool, but you have to learn what it is and what it isn't. I have interviews with Lyft and he's 95 years old about his model he's written a number of other books about cults as well as with trump um and pimps and traffickers talking about how they groom and mind control people trumpers will want to be, listen to that too and i've done extensive work with sex trafficking survivors as well as labor trafficking experts so my bite model really works for both of those things but there's a, a, a set of what you don't do and what you can do. And family members and friends who have a loved one in the cult of MAGA, the first thing they need to do is educate themselves. I have the influence continuum model, ethical to unethical, the bite model, learning about malignant narcissists like chapter three talks compares trump to uh jim jones and hubbard and moon so educate yourself first 
And then you want to build rapport and trust again. So if you've blocked your loved one or you've called them bad names, you want to start with your tail between your legs and say, I miss you. You are my favorite uncle. You know, I'm so sorry. I, I blocked you. I want you back in my life. We can agree not to talk about politics, but I, I want, I want you in my life. Build bridges because if we want to influence people in a cult, the last thing you want to do is call them morons, deplorables, idiots, etc. And that's what unfortunately people are doing because of their ignorance and because they don't understand the fundamental attribution error. They don't understand mind control as a dissociative disorder. They don't understand people wake up. They really do get out of this, but they get out because you're respectful and you're asking them questions and waiting for an answer, doing active listening. And instead of attacking the leader, the doctrine, or the policies straight on with facts, you're asking them to go back in time before they met, they ever heard of Trump. What was their first memory of Donald Trump? And often people, when I ask that, they're like, I thought he was a pervert, or I saw him on The Apprentice, and I thought he was an arrogant, you know, piece of work. And I'm like, that's really interesting. So walk me through how you came to start thinking he was a good person to be president of the United States. But you're asking them to think through how their mind got hacked, right? <laughs> and... And so the bottom line is, is being in, in the here and now, present with somebody you care about, acting out of love and respect, controlling your own reactivity, because a lot of people just, they're like, I can't talk to my, my brother. He's just, he makes me want to punch him in the face. Like he's, I can't stand it. And I'm like, you're not mind controlled. He is. You need to learn self regulation. You need to talk to ex MAGA people who've gotten out so you can have hope that this will actually work because it will. But you have to have patience and you have to be in there in this person's life. And you're educating people that brainwashing really exists. It's over there. You're not like sticking it in their faces, right? And people don't want to stay in a mind control cult because there's dissonance between their real self that knows things are very screwed up and what they're constantly hearing on social media, you know, through their cell phone and through Fox News and other channels. It sounds like your prescription really precludes the possibility of of scaling this in a way uh, that you can have mass deprogramming. I mean, it takes one-on-one -on -one attention. In your case, it took a room full of people um, confronting you, but it's not going to be the kind of thing that can be done with a PR campaign or a political ad. It's, it's a sustained effort by people individuals who care about that person and there's really no way to scale it beyond growing the number of people who know how to do it well that's what i was going to say we start with all the family and friends who saw the radicalization have been frustrated as heck and realize you know what it's not hopeless all these pundits that are saying people are brainwashed they'll never come out of it are just plain wrong they have no idea what they're talking about but i do think that there are ways to scale messaging but it has to be customized to different audiences that are within the cult of trump so in my book, I talk about, for example, a massive network of cults called New Apostolic Reformation. Have you ever heard that term? I, I have. I'm going to ask you about it. Okay. Well, so these, these are misrepresented in the media as Christian evangelicals. Well, my friends who are Christian evangelicals are like, this is not what Jesus taught. 
These people are self-proclaimed prophets or apostles who speak in tongues and supposedly cast out demons and do faith healings. And it's these people who prophesied Trump won in 2020, and they are so programmed to be afraid of Satan, just like I was in the Moonies, that they're following their prophet and apostle, and they, were, they don't trust any media or any information that's different than what they're told God said. But there are ex-members of New Apostolic Reformation. In fact, I've interviewed a former pastor of one of these churches, Andre Gagne, who has a book out about it. And there's a fissure that's happened in NAR, which is fascinating because there are some people who are sticking with, well, God said Trump won 2020, Biden stole it. And there are others that are going, oh, wait a minute. Uh, there seems to be overwhelming evidence that actually he lost it. So maybe we should back off on that messaging. So there's a fissure starting. In the, but we're talking about 40 to 50 million Americans and some estimated 900 million worldwide in these groups. Can you talk about the importance of prophecy in that movement? You alluded to it with the unfulfilled prophecy of the, the election of Trump in 2020, but there are some very creative responses to that. There are some who say, well, actually, he is the president, others who link the prophecy unfulfilled to conspiracy theories and say it's just proof that the deep state is even stronger than we thought. And then there's this fissure, which pits the somewhat sane people on one side looking at the facts of the election against the, the denialists. But at the heart of it all is this belief in the power of prophecy with the epitomization of that being Donald Trump himself as the the super prophet. Right. So I'm Jewish, you know, the the Torah or what the Christians are call the Old Testament. I mean, they they cherry pick things out of the Old Testament and and use it as the inerrant word of God, but they ignore other uses of words. For example, they are typically homophobic. And they, they say it's an abomination to be gay, but they forget that the same word for abomination in the Torah is used for shellfish. But you don't see any of these folks not eating shrimp or lobster, right? Because it's convenient to go after gays, but not convenient to not eat shellfish, etc. Um, in the, in the Torah, it says very clearly that if you're a prophet and what you say doesn't come true, you should be stoned to death. Like, it's really clear that if you're a real, genuine prophet, then everything comes true because you're speaking for God. And if one single thing doesn't, you're dead. Well, they, they, they conveniently forget that one too. Um, and honestly, the Jewish religion said, you know, we're done with the prophets. <laughs> we're done. We're, you know, we've evolved. It's rabbinic interpretation. We do believe in God, but it's not, um, it's a very different God than presented by the New Testament image of Jesus. Do truth tellers face just an inherent disadvantage in the media? ecosystem we we now inhabit. You talked about messaging strategies that may be effective. I just, I can't imagine anything more clickable or potentially viral than, than the ones that engender fear and paranoia. It just seems like that's how our brains are wired. Hate, hate, disgust also is very, it's going to the brain stem, the amygdala, not our appealing to people's higher functions. Well, there's there's an evolutionary imperative for those kinds of reactions. There isn't as strong of an evolutionary imperative to hope and tolerance and caring about each other. I mean, in the long run, I hope those will win, but the immediate reaction seems to um to to always favor those 
those types of emotions. Hate, yeah, fear. that's how our brain works. It, you know, evolution has said, act extra if you think there's a danger. So you're, we're hardwired to react to fear or, you know, or to what we perceive to be dangerous, hateful things. But we've also evolved a lot. And so the issue is, and I've talked to people who are in neo-Nazi groups, many of these hate groups, and they they leave because people treat them nicely and kindly, and it creates dissonance because they they want to be hated back because that's what they were taught. There's, you know, uh, you know, Jews are all interested in money and they're they're selfish. And Arno Michaelis, who was a white power neo-Nazi way back when talked about how he didn't have lunch and his boss who was a Jew gave him half of a sandwich and that created such dissonance or he went to McDonald's and there was a African-American cashier who was smiling and treating him nicely and he and he basically said you know it just it's hard to hate all the time like you want to you want to have friends and that's another feature about mind control cults is when you're in one of these, you know, the minute you start expressing doubts or you don't go along with exactly what the, the program is, people will turn on you and attack you viciously. And then you realize they're not my real friends. And that's, and I call it conditional love versus actual love. And that's where we go back to family, friends, neighbors, genuinely saying, you're a good guy. I know you, you know, you're a good person. I don't understand how you believe what you believe, but I'm curious. I want you to help unpack it for me. Because if it's true, I want to believe it too. Like that, that works, but you have to understand what you're doing and you have to have some training and coaching on it which i attempt to do how important is the cult leader or in the case of maga the prophet to the movement itself because we can point to examples where the the prophet goes away and the movement collapses but we can point to plenty of others um where the the leader is uh, the leader goes away and the movement grows only stronger. How would you assess MAGA as a, as a movement versus MAGA as a cult dependent on its, on its leader? So uh, what I want to say is that the people following Trump see him as a King Cyrus figure, not a prophet. He's a sinful king that God supposedly uses. Um, and uh, what? why did I put Putin at the top of chapter seven of the puppeteers of the cult of Trump? Because I believe that he is a weapon by a foreign adversary to usurp America uh, and Putin is on an agenda. The Soviet Union fell and he's committed to helping America fall and has used religious right activists um, at great psychological advantage because of our ignorance <laughs> about the fact that psychological warfare is being waged on us. I'll quote William Lenz, 1980s American military strategist who wrote a paper on fourth generation warfare, who paired up with Paul Weirich of the Christian right, met with Trump in the White House, William Lind. And Michael Flynn is part of this whole thing. And it's, it's warfare aimed at causing confusion, uncertainty, doubt, uh, overwhelming people, attacking experts, attacking science, attacking institutions. Because if you disorient people enough, they're going to be responsive to certainty of an authority figure who says, trust me, I'm going to make America great again. And again, it's a matter of who are you, who are you circle, who's your circle 
that you identify with. If it's not your family and your friends from your old, your real church, and it's this group of strangers online, and you're subjecting yourself for eight hours a day, you're gonna, your brain's gonna follow them because they're messaging certainty. So to answer your question about what's going to happen with Trump, uh, it, it, MAGA, if tr when Trump dies or if he's not elected or he goes to jail, psychological warfare is going to keep going. And the question is, will actual Christian scholars who understand the New Testament and the teachings of Jesus, who talked about love and render unto Caesar what's Caesar, you should not be involved with politics, and it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, will challenge all the prosperity uh, ministers that are like, give me money, more money, I need another plane, I need another mansion. If we can get Customized messaging at scale, which involves not only, you know, documentaries, but also podcasts, but empowering people locally as well as on platforms, then we have a, 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 a methodology that can be developed. But on the downside, the big social media platforms like Twitter, or I should say X, uh, Facebook, etc. The billionaires don't want regulation. They don't want to be held responsible for all the harm they're causing. So they're not going to cooperate with an effort to bring democracy, you know, back into full bore because they're in this Ayn Rand, selfishness is good and altruism is evil or nihilism or, or transhumanism. We're all going to go to Mars, us wealthy people and the hell with the earth because it's lost anyway. We, we need to like really get educated and figure out strategy for planetary survival <laughs> for all of us including all the creatures that depend on humans. If the liars and the the conspiracy theorists have as one of their tools that overload of information, I think Steve Bannon called it throwing shit against the wall, it's not like the, the truth tellers can respond in kind. It, it just seems like folks like us are at such a disadvantage in, in, in that we cannot generate nearly as much content if we care about the veracity of it, if we care about the integrity of it, whereas the other side can just churn out story after story and meme after, after meme, and the internet lends itself to favoring that kind of, of content. Your prescription for for more podcasts and and more positive content, I don't think gets us very far. I'm afraid I agree with you largely, um, but there's a lot of very wealthy, concerned people who do want freedom and want minority rights and women's right to choose and gay rights and children's rights, etc. But they seem to not be open to looking for out of the box solutions. And my my prescription is mobilizing the millions of Americans who are former members of all types of cults and getting them to reach out to their community, their the, the people who knew them and knew them as radicalized people coming back and creating a uh, public health emergency where we have inoculation preventive education programs. I've created an online course for clinicians and others for nine hours. If they want to know the foundational stuff, aside from reading my books, I've done that. Um, and empowering former MAGA people to be reverse engineering uh, how they recruited all these people into believing in Trump in the first place. Um the bottom line is, is I feel I'm an idealist. I feel like our job is to do everything possible that we can and um, hope that uh, people will rise up uh, aspirationally 
and out of love and out of a desire for survival versus the people who are the mass mobs that have the night, you know, the AR 15s. Did you know my former cult has an AR 15 factory making them? And two compounds, two compounds, one in Tennessee and one near Waco, Texas, using vets to train people how to do civil war in the streets. Now. Wow. So, but I have to be an optimist. I don't know. I don't know what else to do other than uh, we need to teach everyone mind control is real. It exists. Here's how to identify it. I did a doctoral dissertation showing my bite model as a scientific construct. It was recently, uh, there was a content validity study that was just finished at Boston University. It really, it helps people go, wait a minute, what I grew up in is an authoritarian cult. <laughs> you know, once you can go, oh, it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, has feathers like a duck. It's hard to pretend that you didn't know that in the first place. We're almost out of time, but I have to ask you about something I think I heard you say on a podcast, which is that ISIS used the movies, The Lord of the Rings and The Matrix as part of its recruiting and programming strategies for for its members. Is that is that true? Yeah, absolutely. I, I did a whole research project in 2015 on ISIS recruitment. Malcolm Nance, by the way, wrote a book and use the bite model on ISIS as a cult. Um, and most QAnon people are in, use the matrix. Most authoritarian cults use movies to help it recruit and indoctrinate people. Why? Humans are storytellers. We make sense of reality from stories. And if you can get somebody to watch The Exorcist and then say, God made this movie, this is what will happen if you leave, and you accept that authority figure as God's agent on earth, man, you're in deep doo-doo. Well, that, I think, helps explain part of Trump's appeal because he is such a performer, he is such a showman, and I, I would guess, tell me if I'm wrong, but his acts trigger the same kinds of responses that uh, that these adherents feel when they're watching one of those movies and feel like they're in it. So let's go back for a minute. I know we're wrapping up, but I talked about NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. Yeah. We should mention Christian nationalism and Seven Mountain Dominionism, which are related uh, cult groups, destructive groups. Mark Burnett, who did The Apprentice, does Survivor, does Shark Tank. He's the head of media for the Seven Mountain Dominionism. Think really? about that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, but educating people, they really want to take over the country and take over the world for their version of Jesus Christ that has nothing to do with the historical Jesus who was a Jew and taught love and and helping minister to the poor and the weak and the widow and the sick. This is power. And I think state powers are using religious groups as front groups to hack people's minds and do terrorism. And I know we're wrapping up, but I would have done terrorist acts if I was given an AR-15 and told to go to Times Square. I would, would not have hesitated. That's how programmed I was. And that's part of why I'm so passionate to tell people, hello, this is real, This and there's a cure. You don't need to give up. Well, Stephen, Dr. Hassan, thank you so much for, for joining us. I feel like there's a ton more we could cover so let's let's book another conversation soon it's been great having you on yeah thanks for your good work and having me on take care bye love this video make sure you stay up to date on the latest breaking news and all things midas by signing up to the midas touch newsletter at midastouch.com newsletter